Hi, I am working on a corset cover and I am uh, partway through cutting out the pattern pieces and I thought I might as well bring you guys along for the ride. That would be fun. Um, I'm just using the American Duchess, or American Duchess, I'm sorry, truly Victorian. Uh, this is a really unflattering angle, but I don't want to balance my iPad somewhere while I'm cutting. You guys can, you guys have seen me at unflattering angles before. I'm sure you'll see me at unflattering angles again. You're also seeing me with a very unflattering hairstyle. I, every few years I try to make the Victorian or the 1890s frizzed bang style work and it always ends up, you know, it's a style that looks good exclusively on old photographs and Carolina Zabrowska. Uh, so it also makes me feel like I'm forever wearing a hat since I'm not used to having anything touching my forehead. So I don't think it's going to last very long. Also, it's really difficult to play. I don't like putting my hair up in curlers at night and then they really hurt all night because the curlers are kind of pulling my hair. Anyway, this is not what you're here for. It's not what I'm here to tell you. I am using the truly Victorian, uh, mid-Victorian corset cover pattern TV 107. Um... It's mid-Victorian, I do 1890s, but um, the uh, one of them, view B, is, where is it? Arr! View B is, um, it says in here, was popular into the 1880s, and in some of my 1890s magazines, I've seen corset covers that look pretty much identical to this, so I'm just going with it. Um, it was not my intention to do, uh, to have any sewing projects over spring break. Um, I was going to wait until I'd graduated from school and had gotten a job and, you know, kind of settled down before I embarked on more sewing projects because I, you know, I was planning on using spring break to work on my thesis, um, which I did do. My thesis is coming along very well. It's about an antique diary that I, that I have. Um, but then, uh, we were advised that it was not safe to return to campus because I do go to school in Washington State. We were advised that it was not safe to return to campus. Uh, all classes were moved online and graduation was canceled, um, which was a little bit saddening to me. I had looked forward to showing uh, family and friends around campus and uh, playing the pipe organ for them in the chapel, but I suppose canceling graduation is better than spreading this great plague, eclect corona. Um, so, I find myself with a lot of time on my hands because I also can't do all of the, you know, environmental, voluntary, activism y stuff that I'm used to doing. So, I find myself with a lot of time on my hands. So, sewing it is. I, I went and uh, did my panic shopping at Joann's and at Mill End before they closed down. Um, and I got this, I got a lot of this white cotton. Um, this stuff is, I think it might be made out of steel. It is, it is so uh, tough and sturdy, um, which is good because it means that anything I make out of it will last approximately until the second coming. Um, it's bad because that means it's really difficult to pin through and kind of difficult to sew. But once I've gotten it sewn up, then I'm good to go until I'm dead. Um... <sighs> uh, so yeah, that's my, my life in a brief nutshell. Um, I can't think of anything else to talk about other than my thesis. Um, and I could just turn off the camera and check back in, check back in with you later, but uh, my bird is talking to me and I want to talk to people because I haven't done very much of that over the last while, um, as has, as has nobody has, <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm just going to keep on talking, and if you guys don't like it, then you are perfectly willing, perfectly, um, capable of fast forwarding. So, my thesis. I am in freshman year of college. I got a bee in my bonnet um, that I, I had to have an antique diary because I you know I could learn so much from reading an antique diary and blah, 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 blah. So I went on to eBay and I found this diary. 
and it was from 1893, so perfect, just my just in my era. Um, and uh, it was really, really, it's it's the best thing about it was that it was twenty dollars, whereas pretty much every other diary on there was, uh, you know, in the, the three hundred dollar range. So I snapped it up. It was shipped from California, and it was late. I can't remember exactly what the listing was, but it was something along the lines of antique Victorian 1893 World's Fair Columbian Exposition Diary. Um, so I assumed, uh, based on the uh, World's Fair being mentioned in the listing and the fact that it was shipped to me from California, that it was written either uh, it, that you know it had something to do with the World's Fair and that and or that the person who uh, wrote it came from California. Um, now, once I got the diary and uh, actually looked at it, I found out that the World's Fair in the posting was a reference to an advertisement for the World's Fair that was um, in the cover of the diary. Um, it, was, it was an Excelsior diary, and you see these a lot, these Excelsior diaries, and it, oftentimes in diaries of the time, they would have interest, like just things that you might need. Um, so historical facts about the United States, uh, like it has when, when each of the states were settled and when they were incorporated. Um, and uh, this one also has an ad for the World's Fair, which was going on at this time. Um, so I became aware that it, it, it had nothing to do with the World's Fair. Um, I kept on uh, laboring under the assumption, though, that it was written somewhere in California. Um, the author never... Uh, told me specifically where she was, but she um, kept on talking about going to the pond and going to Scotta. Um, and I kept on like trying to find a place in California that could be considered to be the pond or Scotta. Um, and I couldn't do it. But then, as I was reading, I came upon the entry, Katie F. Jones hanged herself in Augusta last night. And We'll get back to the suicide later because that's also important. But what, 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 what really caught my eye was Augusta. Now, Augusta, there are several Augustas in action. There are only really two Augustas in the United States that I know of. There's Augusta, Georgia, which, I mean, sure, whatever. But there's also Augusta, Maine. Augusta is the capital of Maine. And as I've mentioned before, I'm from Maine. Um, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> my, my friends are... Uh, get a little bit tired of of me talking about how great Maine is, and many of my friends are from California, so um, we have a running joke where I will uh, talk about how lazy all Californians are, and they'll talk about how uh, uptight all Mainers are. Um, but it's all for fun, all in all in good fun, all in laughs. Um, anyhow, so she talked about somebody hanging herself in Augusta. And that made me realize this woman lived in Maine. And then I realized that Scotta meant Damrascotta, which is a uh, town on the, um, not Penobscot, on the, just a minute, Pemaquid, on the Pemaquid Peninsula. Uh, interestingly, Damrascotta is also the oyster capital of New England. So, um, you know. We're dealing with some with some some highfalutin people here, um, so that was a huge breakthrough. So that made me realize, okay, so she lives. She's from Maine. She's from my home state. I have no idea how this diary got to California, but she's from my home state. Um, she went up to Damascotta relatively frequently. I uh, grew up in Bath, um, which is about half an hour drive away from Damascotta. I've uh, I also, for a time, lived in Alma, which is very near Damascotta. And then there was a time when I actually lived in Damascotta. So it's very likely that she and I have been into the same buildings and walked the same streets, which is very, very interesting. Um, and then I, so then I thought, okay, so she um, lives near Damascotta, but not in Damascotta. Because if she lived in Damascotta, then she would have no reason to go there. Um, but she had to live near enough to Damascotta that she could get there and home in a day by carriage. Um, so then I thought, oh, so maybe the pond is either an ice pond or a fish hatchery, um, because those were both um, pretty prominent uh, trades in, in Maine at the time. Um, but no, then I realized that the pond is a round pond. A round pond is a town in 
It's a village in the township of Bristol, which is the township just um, just east of Damariscotta on the um, Pamukkale Peninsula. And uh, the pond is is Round Pond. Round Pond is is not actually a pond. It's a circular kind of cove um, of the ocean. Obviously, a cove of the ocean. Um, so this woman lived in Round Pond, Maine, about 45 minutes drive from my childhood home. Um, I have no idea how her diary got to California. I had no idea that she was from Maine um, when I bought the diary, but it was a huge, huge, it was just amazing to figure this out. So then I figured out uh, where she was from. So I had to figure out, um, naturally, what the author's name was. I assumed that it, the author was a woman um, since she talks about sewing a lot and doing other, other womanly things, but I wasn't sure. But she never mentions her own name in her diary and she never mentions her family's surname. What she does mention is the uh, names, the first names of her family members. So um, it stood to reason that if I were to go through the census records from Round Pond from 1880 and from 1900, I couldn't use the 1890 census because the main 1890 census was destroyed in a fire. Um, so I did not have access to that. But if I went through the town record or the um, census records from uh, Round Pond and found a family that had the uh, people with the first names that she mentioned, in her diary, so I was looking for um, an Arthur, a uh, Lizzie, or something that, you know, a name that could be abbreviated to Lizzie, um, uh, Malcolm, Kenneth, um, you know, names of that nature. Uh, then the one name that was uh, listed there, that was not listed in the diary, was my, was my author. And it took a long time and a lot of searching and a lot of false leads, but I eventually um, discovered that the author of my diary was Miss Maria A. Cox of Round Pond, Maine. She lived from 1840, 1847 or 1848 and, uh, and died in 1905. Um, she had several siblings, only two of them were alive at the time she wrote the diary. Her... And we've also shifted over to the iron since I need to iron stuff, which is a good reason to shift over to the iron. So she had uh, several siblings, but only two of them were alive by the time she was writing the diary. And that was her brother, George, uh, who lived in Massachusetts. And we'll come back to him later. And her brother, Arthur, who lived at home. She lived, uh, she and Arthur both lived with their parents in Round Pond. Uh, and Arthur was married to um, Mary Elizabeth, who um, uh, Miss Cox in her diary refers to as Lizzie. Um, now, George, who lived in Massachusetts, was married to Adele Rose. And uh, she, they, they had, um, so, Brother George and his wife, Adele Rose, had six children named Ernestine, I forget, George Jr., um, Adele Jr., Malcolm, and Kenneth. Now, Adele was mad. As far as I can tell, she was not quite, um, not quite sound in the head because the author of the diary continually mentions that she's, she's in and out of um, asylums and uh, staying with doctors and stuff like that. Um, so I can only assume that she was um, having some mental issues. Uh, and her three youngest children, so uh, brother George and Adele's three youngest children, Adele Jr., um, Malcolm, and Kenneth live in Maine with uh, Maria, the diary author, uh, her brother Arthur, his wife uh, Lizzie, and Maria and Arthur's mother and father. Um, and my guess is they came to this arrangement um, to make life a little bit easier for uh, brother George and uh, Adele, um, since Adele was in and out of uh, asylums, um, 
she was clearly not going to be incredibly present as a parental figure. Um, and George, in addition, he was he ran a, a leather works company, the Cox Leather Works. Um, I've tried to find information on it, I can't, um, which is upsetting because I want to learn more about this family. Um, he would not have had time to care for three young children. Um, so that is very interesting. And um, every once in a while, he'll send them an expenses box, um, which I'm assuming, you know, he's kind of, he's paying for his children so it doesn't uh, cost his sister and brother and uh, his parents money to keep him there. So that in a nutshell is my thesis. Oh, back to Katie F. Jones, the one who hanged herself in Augusta. Um, I don't know how she was related to the family. Um, I don't think she was a relation. I think she was a neighbor or a friend. Um, what I do know is that Augusta is home to Amhi, the Augusta Mental Health Institute. Um, although at that time, I believe it was called the Augusta Insane Asylum or the, the main state asylum or something along those lines. Um, and actually, uh, um, two summers ago, whatever, whenever I uploaded my hairstyle video, that was the summer, I had an internship with the Department of Environmental Protection, which is sort of the uh, state version of the uh, EPA. And the DEP uh, is based out of the old Amhi campus. Amhi closed down in 2002, I believe. Um, and, um, but, it was, um, it was, Amhi was closed down, but it was kind of just closed down in Maine because all of the patients were moved over to the Riverview facility, um, which is actually on the same campus. So I drove by an actual uh, <laughs> asylum on my way. I, I essentially parked in the parking lot of, a, of, an asylum, of an asylum every day going into my internship. Um, and occasionally, not occasionally, rarely there were what were called elopements from the Riverview facility. <laughs> Um, and actually in the 80s, somebody, uh, there was an elopement from the Riverview facility, um, and, uh, the elope stabbed a girl to death in the Arboretum. Um, but that's neither here nor there. That's a story for a different time. Um, the Riverview facility is also, uh, closing down now because it is a, um, low security facility, but they were keeping some high facility or high security patients there with my understanding. Don't, don't take that for as gospel, um, because that could be wrong. That's just my understanding. Um, so it's either in the process of closing or will close down. Um, and I'm not sure what's going to happen to the patients after that. But the point is in 1893, KDF Jones was in, um, what is now Amhi. Uh, Augusta Mental Health Institute, and she hanged herself. And I was I, I trolled through their uh, records because their some of their records have been digitalized and are online. And I found her death certificate. And the death certificate does not say that she died by suicide. It just says accidental death. Um, but it seems as though it was in fact suicide. It was in fact suicide. Um, so that's all very interesting. Of course, also very tragic. I don't want to trivialize this poor woman's. Um, this poor woman's suicide, right? Just talking about how interesting it is. It was also very tragic, and it should never have happened. Um, but that is my, my thesis in a nutshell. Um, I'm very excited, very interesting, interested in it. Amhi was a fascinating place to work, or the Amhi uh, campus was a fascinating place to work. Um, because... It, it, of course, there weren't any uh, mental patients in the actual buildings that I was working in. Of course, I did mention the Riverview facility was still there. Um, but that was in a separate building. Um, but uh, the, the facility is actually in a, in a state of disrepair. It, they, they began building the asylum in the 1840s, uh, early, early 1840s. And that uh, building is still there. It's this gigantic, gigantic, very imposing, very grim, very austere also quite beautiful in its own way, stone building. Um, and it is completely closed off, but there are tunnels underneath uh, all of the, connecting all of the buildings. Because in Maine, uh, in the winter, it snows a lot. Um, and it gets very, very cold. And um, 
they built these tunnels so that the hospital staff could get around um, between all the buildings in the winter without having to go out into the cold. Um, and the rumor is that when an inmate died in the winter, because um, also in the winter in Maine, the ground freezes solid. So rumor has it that when an inmate died in the winter, uh, the hospital staff, this is a little bit gory, um, the hospital staff would uh, take up the cement flooring of the uh, tunnels, bury them under the floor, and then just put more concrete over them um, because they wouldn't be able to dig a grave outside. So according to rumor, there are uh, bodies buried all over the place in, in those um, in those tunnels under the floors. Um, again, I have no idea if that's true. It's probably not true. Um, and these tunnels are closed off now. For the most part, you can't get into them. I cannot get used to this hairstyle on myself. I feel like I look like Eunice from the Carol Burnett show. Um, I'll put a picture of her. I didn't talk about a major world event that's going on right now, coronavirus. Can you believe it? This, this, well, I did kind of mention it, this terrible plague, eclipsed corona. Um, can you believe it? I can't think of, I'm pretty sure this is the only time that America has had to deal with something like this since 1918, since the, the influenza epidemic of 1918. Um, my great grandfather was a doctor. Also, my great great grandmother was also a doctor, um, but this is not about her. I have her uh, photograph in my bedroom. Um, but uh, my great grandfather, so my grandmother's father, was a doctor, and it was during the uh, influenza epidemic that he moved to Arizona. Um, I believe this is correct. The, the, in in uh, 1918, he and his family, or maybe a bit after 1918, um, he moved to Arizona to be a doctor there since they would send the influenza patients to Arizona and uh, places in the, in the uh, south um, west because it's very dry there and they thought that a, a hot, dry climate was um, good for the flu. Uh, so, yeah, so my grandmother was born in Arizona in 1935. Um, it's interesting to talk to her. I was once looking through um, one of my Victorian shopping catalogs, and you can get them pretty cheaply on Amazon, like the, the reprints, the um, originals are a bit harder to come by, but still not that hard to come by. Um, I was looking through one while she was um, over at our house for dinner, and she was looking over my shoulder, and she pointed to a, a mangle on the page and she said oh we had one of those when I was growing up and it was just so so interesting to to talk to her about it and she, and she told me all about her um her childhood and and using all of it and then and then we, I, we flipped through the uh catalog and she there were quite a few things in that catalog that she had had growing up of course she'd had you know there were the 1897 versions in my catalog and then she'd had the 1940s versions but oftentimes they were quite uh, similar in construction. Um, but coronavirus, can you guys believe this? It's like something out of a movie. It's moved so quickly. Um, on March, no, that's not going to work. I'm never going to remember the day. It's Friday, two Fridays ago, I think, either two or three Fridays ago, I was at school and I ordered a pair of shoes from American Duchess. I believe it was the Tissot shoes, um, the, the 1850s pumps, uh, in the full expectation that I would be wearing them to the next Tacoma Contra Dance on March 21st. Not only was the Contra Dance cancelled, but I was not even in Tacoma on March 21st because we were told not to return to school. It's just incredible how quickly this whole thing has, um, has progressed. It's, it's unlike anything that I have ever seen before. And the stores, the stores are, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I, it's, you know, there is still an incredible amount of abundance at all of the stores, but I've never seen more empty shelves in a safe way than I have been seeing these last few weeks, which again is incredible. Our, our 1930s, you know, uh, Great Depression ancestors are rolling over in their graves listening to me freak out about, oh my goodness, there's, you know, no 
there are, there are no grapes left in the supermarket. Um, like, yeah, I didn't eat for three days. Blah, 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 blah. But I, I reserve the right to be shocked because it is unlike anything I've ever seen. And it's just amazing how quickly it's all progressed. Like when I, when I left to come home for spring break, um, I, you know, just kind of knocked on my friend's doors. I, I, um, lived in a, a house on campus. So, um, we all had our own rooms and then there was, it was a common kitchen and some, some bathrooms and, um, or two bathrooms to be specific. One half, one full. I think, I'm not actually sure what a half bath is. The, the one in the, in the ground floor just had a sink and a toilet. And then the one upstairs had a sink, a toilet and a shower and bathtub. Although nobody ever used the bathtub. It was kind of disgusting. Um, you know, I just kind of knocked on my friend's doors and called, you know, bye, see you, see you next week when we all come back to them through the doors. And, you know, it was, you know, we never anticipated that, that we weren't going to be coming back to school. I mean, we knew it was a possibility, but it was kind of like a possibility in the same way, uh, in the same way that Trump winning the presidential election was a possibility in 2018. Um, it was a possibility, but it, well, you know, it wasn't going to happen. And it was the same way with, um, school. It, it was a possibility that we weren't going to end up coming back after spring break, but it wasn't actually going to happen. And then it happened. It's just shocking. Um, and then one of my friends was planning on staying in uh, Tacoma for spring break. So she didn't really have a way of getting out of there. Did I forget to mark out the things on this one too? She didn't really have a way of getting out of there. Um, and I was loath to tell her to, you know, get on a, a train where sickness conjugates or sickness um commute uh darn it i always forget this word sickness it doesn't conjugate sickness gathers where there are a lot of people and sickness can easily be spread i was loath to tell her to get on a train and, or a plane so i drove back up to tacoma because i'm not in maine right now i'm with my mother in portland oregon so i drove back up to tacoma to evacuate her and to begin packing up my uh my room at school and then I had to drive back up a few days later to finish um, getting all of my stuff out of there. I also had to go to the cobbler because before spring break I dropped off a pair of boots at the cobbler to have the heels fixed because again I was, I was in full anticipation of coming back and oh it was just it was just crazy um and now all of the uh now everything is closed it's just amazing I I was looking uh, the other day to see if I could, um, make some masks to donate, um, you know, just to, you know, do my part a little bit, but apparently emergency responders in the Portland area are not in need of masks. So I'm back to not really having anything, having anything I can do to help other than staying out of the way, which is, um, you know, no, uh, no, no small help. It is, it's quite helpful for me to stay out of the way, especially for me, since I, I'm not very good at staying out of the way most of the time. I remember one time uh, when I was little, a wildfire started on uh, some very rural land that my my uh, family owned. And I was determined to help, but I was told to stay out of the way, which I thought was incredibly unfair. I was six years old, so it's probably, it's, it's a very good thing that they kept me out of the way. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here to uh, babble at you right now. This video is either going to be the most successful or the least successful video that I've ever put on YouTube. I'm calling it right now. Um, and what was I saying? Oh, yes. So, um, a fire started on the land, and um, I was told to stay out of the way. And after a bit of complaining, I got up there with, there was a pile of sand kind of on the driveway. And I uh, knew from watching Smokey the Bear cartoons, is that correct? Were there Smokey the Bear cartoons in the nineties and two thousands? I feel like there were, because I feel like I, I have some memory of watching a cartoon about Smokey the Bear. And there was a forest fire that was started by a man dropping a burning cigarette in the, in the forest. And um, there was something about a, a f they were making a fire break or something, but the fire jumped the fire break. Oh, it was very dramatic. But I remembered that sand, fire can't travel over sand from watching that. So I got up on top of this sand pile that was um, uh, in the driveway that I often 
that I would often play on. And, you know, looking back on it now, that sand pile was much too small to prevent any sort of fire from uh, getting me. But I thought that it was this, a safe place. And, and admittedly, it was a safe place since it was across the driveway from the fire. So that the driveway would have provided a pretty good, a pretty good fire break uh, since that was a significantly larger amount of sand. I've had a little bit of a sore throat. This is the most I've talked for weeks. I am a little bit grumpy with this pattern since it, it I mean, um, um, I keep on wanting to say American Duchess. Truly Victorian patterns are wonderful. I'm sorry for holding the pin in my mouth. I know some people can't stand that. Um, on the whole, I, 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 I do love uh, American Duchess. I did it again. On the whole, I do love Truly Victorian patterns, um, but it said the thing is i cut this out to my my largest measurement which is my uh bust measurement which doesn't correspond with my my waist measurement um so i cut it out to to g which um the g measurement matched my my bust measurement but my waist measurement was more of a b um and that is always quite in, quite uh frustrating whenever i'm working from a pattern like this so i'm um have to stitch it all together and then I'm gonna have to just kind of pinch out the seams and, and fit it which is fine I mean that's that's what it is that's not difficult to do um but I was reading the uh thing about how to customize your pattern and I thought oh hooray I won't have to um I won't have to deal with The, that's the side front. I won't have to deal with the, um, did I chalk that one in? Yes, I did. I won't have to do that whole, that whole process. I can just, um, uh, get on. I can just alter my pattern. And I went through that whole thing very, uh, carefully. And I ended up with a pattern that was still cut to the G measurement, <laughs> uh, completely. So, um, I went through this very complex uh, process and uh, nothing changed. So I was a little bit ticked off last night, but that's not truly Victorian's fault. That's um, my fault for not reading it correctly. Oh, I should actually show you what I'm, what I'm actually sewing. I've just been talking and working on this uh, off camera and, and you haven't been able to see anything. <laughs> um, so this is what I've got so far. This is the back, it's just pinned together. Um, I'm, a, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work with the, there not being any like center back seam. So this is completely, so this, well, right here, this is completely straight. Um, and there's no shaping to it at all. So I'm a little bit concerned about how that's going to work out. The same with the, uh, center front. There's, it's completely straight and all of the shaping comes from, uh, the other, the side gores. So I'm a little bit concerned how that's going to work out, um, but there is quite a bit of shaping in the side gores, and also it's a corset cover, it's not a bodice, so it does not need to fit quite like a second skin. It doesn't need to fit as, as well as, for example, my uh, my basque waist needed to fit. So I think what happened? Oh, right. I think it should be fine. I'm planning on doing this with uh, French seams, so this is actually the outside, and this is the inside. Um, but before I do the French seams, I want to stitch the whole thing together and uh, make any adjustments that need, need doing. Yes. So I am going to, now that you know what I'm actually sewing, I'm going to um, say goodbye for now and uh, I'll check back with you when I have um, either something more to say or uh, I have reached a point in the sewing process that uh, you will want to see. All right, well, I'm back. I've decided to keep on, on yammering. Um, I hope you guys don't mind my, my talking at you, but uh, if you do, there's nothing that's forcing you to watch this video. Uh, 
What was I decided to... Oh, yeah. Um, TV shows. Have you guys Have you guys been taking the chance to uh, watch any TV shows that you've been meaning to watch for, you know, your whole life and have never gotten around to because you didn't have time, but now you do have time since you can't go anywhere or do anything? Um, yeah, I thought so. I have not been doing that. I've just been kind of revisiting old favorites. Um... One of which is Murder, She Wrote, starring Angela Lansbury. I love Angela Lansbury. She's absolutely wonderful. I I think the first thing I ever saw her in was um, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. And if you haven't seen Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, you should see Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. I absolutely adore that movie. Uh, it is the only movie for which... I, I it, that, that movie is the only movie who's... Um, how do I phrase this in a grammatically correct way? Um, there are no movies other than that one for which I have sought out the opening credits and just watched the opening credits just for their own um, for their own sake, since the opening credits are so beautiful. If you haven't seen it, the movie is about a, um, it takes place in England in uh, nineteen forty. And uh, it's about these three children, Carrie, Charles, and Paul, who are sent to the country during the bombings, um, as so many stories, it seems, uh, uh, start. Um, and they are sent to live with a woman named Miss Price, who does not want them. And um, it soon becomes clear that she is, in fact, a witch. And uh, she is working on... Um, the, the whole the whole movie centers around her search to find this spell, the substitutionary locomotion spell. Um, so she can essentially uh, animate, bring to life inanimate objects. And uh, as she says, as she, to quote her, um, to do her bit for the national emergency. Um, but it's an absolutely wonderful movie. It has that guy in it whom everybody loves. I can never remember his name. He played Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins. Um, oh, what's his name? It's on the tip of my tongue, but it's not going to come to me. But he plays a character in it. It's absolutely wonderful. There's an amazing song about Portobello Road. Um, and Portobello, that, that song is what made me want to go to Portobello Road. And... Um, that uh, is the, the reason, that, that song is, is the reason that I eventually did go to Portobello Road when I had a layover in London and got my Chatelaine. Um, so, I owe my Chatelaine that movie, in a way. Where's my thread? Here's my thread. But, I was, how did I start talking about Ben Nog? Uh, Angela Lansbury. Uh, Murder, She Wrote. Murder, She Wrote. So, Murder, She Wrote um, is from the 80s. If you've seen it, then... Uh, congratulations. Uh, Murder, She Wrote is a show from the 80s and 90s. It follows Jessica Fletcher, who is a retired school teacher who lives in the fictional town of Cabot Cove, Maine. Uh, side note, for anybody who has uh, been to Maine, it is painfully obvious that this show is not shot in Maine. It was shot actually in California. Um, but, you know, Maine does not have mountains. There's Mount Katahdin, um, which by Maine standards is a mountain. By the standards of the rest of the country, it's a lump. Um, and there are uh, lots of mountains in Cabot Cove. Also, for, a, for a, a town that's supposed to take place about 20 miles north of Portland, they all talk like they are from up in Presque Isle of Caribou in these incredibly exaggerated uh, fake Maine accents. Um, but in spite of all of that, I absolutely... Uh, love, <laughs> love the show. Um, and it's, I didn't even mention, so it's a murder mystery show. And Jessica Fletcher, this uh, retired school teacher, uh, is a very successful uh, murder mystery novelist. And she, she has an obscene number of uh, nieces and nephews. I think Wikipedia says that she has like 72 nieces and nephews. Um, and she also has tons of friends all over the world, so very few of the episodes actually take place in Cabot Cove, which is a shame, because the, my, my favorite ones are the ones that take place in Cabot Cove. And wherever she goes, uh, Cabot Cove also is the murder capital of the world. 
um, if, if it had existed, its murder rate is, I can't remember how much higher, but it, its murder rate is, is ridiculously higher than the real life murder capital of the world. Um, but wherever Jessica Fletcher goes, or if she happens to be staying at home, wherever she's, uh, whenever she's at home, there's always a murder. And there are some theories going around that she is actually the killer all along, and she just frames innocent people wherever she goes. But I personally don't believe that. Um, I think that she just is incredibly unlucky, or lucky enough, to find murders. And she always has to solve them. Sometimes the police want her help, usually they don't. Um, yeah, so that's a wonderful show, and I've been, uh, watching that one. Okay, I'm gonna use the sewing machine, so I will, uh, turn this off. Bye. Just very briefly, I'm stitching the seams together, there's no way you can see that. I'm stitching the seams together with the widest setting that my, that my, um, machine has, um, because I am going to be, um, going through and, and altering these seams, um, I don't want it to be difficult to um, remove these stitches if I need to. Uh, so I'm using the machine equivalent of a basting stitch. Um, yeah, bye-bye. Congregate. The word I was looking for is congregate. All right, I've gotten the uh, back stitched together. Uh, I've changed my mind. I'm not gonna do French seams. I'm gonna do flat felt flat felled seams. Um, I realized that French seams, if I were to um, pin this down and, and take out uh, space from the seams um, to make it fit me, and then I uh, did it into French seams, then it would be too small. And I don't want to deal with the math for that, so I'm just going to do flat felled seams. They're not as pretty, um, but you know, nobody's going to be seeing this. That's exactly what I said with my petticoat video. Nobody's going to see this other than myself and the entire internet, so it's okay if it's a little bit less pretty. I really ought to do the French seams, like the, or the, the flat felling part by hand. That's what I did on my petticoat, but that takes a really long time. And I don't really want to do it that way. So I'm just gonna do it by machine and um, just make sure that it looks neat at least. Um, but I'm gonna put this aside for now because what I need to work on now is the uh, front facings. I'm gonna put on the front facings. Um, I'm not gonna have you watch the process. The uh, instructions for doing the front facings are in the pattern, so um, yeah, uh, you don't really need to see me doing it. Um, I So tonight I'm going to put on the front facings, um, sew up the buttonholes. I don't like to do machine buttonholes. My machine buttonholes look really, really bad. I think I don't have like a special tool or something. It's something there's something missing that makes my machine buttonholes look really bad. So I prefer to do hand done buttonholes. And then I have so many buttons. I have more buttons than any person could ever possibly use. So I'm gonna go through my button bin and find some buttons to use to uh, close it up down the front. Um, and hopefully they'll all match, but if they don't match completely, that's fine. Um, and I will check back in with you tomorrow. Uh, with that, and we'll uh, do a fitting. So. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm back. It's the next day. Do you like my shirt? Is it actually an old nightgown just tucked into my skirt? Absolutely not. Of course it isn't. I don't know how you could think that. So I have the uh, buttons sewn on to this side. I couldn't find uh, five matching ones. So what I did was I used three. I had three of these and I had two of these. So I put the um, ones that are slightly carved here, 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 and here, and then I put the plain ones here and here. Um, so it looks like I intended to do that. And then I have the buttonholes all stitched. I'm gonna show you this one because it's the best one. Well, okay, maybe that one's the best one. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is put these onto the rest of the corset cover and then uh, try it on over my corset. I'm gonna try it on inside out so I can uh, pin away or pinch away excess fabric. Um, yes. See you when I've done that. Bye-bye. All right, so this is what we've got so far. And can I just say that going around and ironing and flat felling all of these seams in here, all of these sharply curved seams, never again. 
next time I do this, I am definitely doing French seams and I don't care how much math I have to do because this was absolutely horrendous <laughs> to do. Um, but it is finally done. Um, and uh, I cannot believe I did this, but I made a little cut in the actual fabric while I was trimming down the um, seam allowances. So I'm gonna have to go over that and, and darn that, but I can do that later. Um, so the goal or the, the task now is to finish off the neck and the armholes. Now the, the um, instructions say to finish them off um, by inserting, like doing heirloom insertion lace. Um, I don't really see how that's going to finish anything off. So what I'm going to do is just do a really small, I'm just going to turn everything over twice um, and just finish that off. And then I'm going to put this lace that I have left over for my petticoat project on top of that hem around the, or around that part around the neck and around the armholes. Um, and I will catch you later. Maybe, I'm trying to decide if I want to remove the bottom ruffle. So it's just ruffled up at the top. But I kind of, I think I'm gonna keep both ruffles. If I want to take off the bottom ruffle later, I can. So right now I'm gonna work on folding under um, these, oops, let me see the uh, armhole seams and the um, neckline seam. And I will uh, then sew on the lace and I will come back when I've done that. Bye. All right, and we're done. And behind me, you can see the mess that is my uh, sewing room slash the living room. <laughs> um, it always looks really, really horrible after I finished a project, um, but this is what we have. It's not the best work I've ever done. It does not fit as well as it could. Um, yeah, I don't know. I tried so hard to get it to fit and it just would not. There was nothing I could do to get it to not wrinkle around here. So I eventually decided to just leave it slightly too big in the waist area. I mean, it's, it's good now. It's an undergarment. Nobody's really going to be seeing it and, um, it, uh, of course the covers don't need to fit, you know, exactly perfectly. Um, this is what I've got up here around the neck and the sleeves. Um, but yeah, next time I make a corset cover, I'm definitely doing French seams. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this more chatty video and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.